Hi, my name's David Simon. I'm a research fellow and lecturer on law at the Petrie Fahm Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. And I'm here today to talk about uh, work I've done with Aaron Kesselheim, who is a faculty member at Harvard Medical School on tort liability for physicians and manufacturers who uh, either make or use in their practice remote patient monitoring devices. Um, and our work is looking primarily at when liability will arise for these two actors and what kind of factors affect the liability analysis. Now, what's one thing that I'd like you to know about this area? Well, to be uh, a little bit <clears throat> loquacious, uh, liability for remote patient monitoring or RPM devices is, is an emerging field. New technologies are constantly being developed, redeveloped, and adopted, and there are a lot of interesting devices that take on additional roles, like pacemakers, things that regulate um, the heart, uh, that monitor other, other physiological data uh, about the person who is using them. And there are other new technologies that promise to raise even more complicated questions, like clothing or even skin-based tattoos that can measure physiological information about the patient. Um, so on the technology side, uh, there's a lot of ethical components that we ought to consider. For example, how much information do we want such devices to collect and on what terms? And how do we want them to share information about us? And finally, how much control ought we, ha ought we to have over these devices themselves? The legal side is complicated because both the newness of the technology and the variable potential for uh, harm that it could cause. So for example, uh, federal law preempts or effectively eliminates some state law claims like tort claims for medical devices that have reached the, the market through the most intensive FDA review process. But which claims it eliminates depends often on the courts that are interpreting them. In other words, the jurisdiction in which the claim arises since Many courts have different tests for determining which claims are preempted. Um, and courts also have different tests for figuring out what kind of products are defective and therefore when manufacturers can be held liable for injuries caused by the defective product. So this combined with the newness of the technology, the settings in which they are used, and the purposes for which they are used creates legal uncertainty for injured patients, manufacturers, and physicians. And that's what we hope to explore in our, in our work. Um, what is a prediction for how this area will progress or what, we, what would we like to see happen in this area? Well, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and it may or may not resolve into certainty, but courts will more often be confronted with cases involving these novel technologies. And there are three key issues I expect to become central into, in these disputes. One is causation. So in a tort claim, one of the key issues is did the alleged defect in the product or did the alleged conduct cause the injury in question? Is it responsible for the, for, for the, for the injury? Because we want to hold people responsible for actions which they were responsible for. Um, and so the injured person has to prove that it's the manufacturer or the physician, uh, at least as we've described the problem, is a substantial factor in causing the harm. And in some cases, this may be easier than in others. So for example, if a seizure detection device simply fails to detect a seizure and the patient dies as a result, then causation may be easier to prove than if a heart rate monitor was slightly inaccurate and caused a delay in diagnosis or response to that patient. But in both cases, the, the plaintiff will likely be required to conduct extensive discovery, which is the process by which they, they collect information from the opposing party about the device and probably conduct some sophisticated forensic analysis of the device itself since it's going to include a large software component. So the first issue then is, is causation. The second is physician education. So one product defect claim against the manufacturer is failure to warn. And the argument is that the, the manufacturer is responsible for warning the patient of the risks and benefits of using the device. Importantly though, when a physician is involved in prescribing the device to a patient, many courts hold that the manufacturer has a duty to warn only the physician and not the patient. It then falls to the physician to obtain what's called informed consent from the patient, which is the process by which they inform the patient of all the material risks, all those risks that could make a difference to the, difference to the patient's decision, 
um, and then obtain their consent given those risks to the, to the treatment, or in this case, the use of the device. This so-called uh, learned intermediary doctrine assumes that the, position, the physician is in the, in the best position to both select the device and inform the patient of the risk. And because of this, uh, the learned intermediary doctrine limits manufacturer liability because it essentially transfers, uh, it shrinks the role that manufacturers have to uh, play in providing risk information and in, in, enlarges the role of the physician in providing that information. So as more of these uh, remote patient monitoring devices come to market and more advertisements are directed through social media and TV and the internet to consumers directly, there's an open question, one, it's, one which has been resolved uh, recently in the context of prescription drugs uh, by several courts, about whether this doctrine, this learned intermediary doctrine will, doctrine will continue to apply or whether courts will be willing to abandon it and basically say that the manufacturer has the duty to warn the consumer because they're advertising directly to the consumer, even though a physician may be uh, involved in, in prescribing the device. So that's the second issue. What will happen to this learned intermediary doctrine? The final issue I think that's going to be crucial uh, is whether software is going to be considered a product under uh, product liability laws in tort law and also in contract law where, where these claims generally arise. So there's significant questions both in tort law and in contract law about whether software will be treated as a product or a service. And the distinction is, is, is important because services generally do not fall under products liability. Um, they're treated as a separate category, which could rule out contract-based claims, which is something we don't talk about in the paper, but it also might rule out strict liability uh, tort claims. Um, so I think what I expect to see in this area is that courts will take kind of a common sense approach and gradually enlarge the definition of, or at least modify the definition of um, good or product to include software, especially software as a medical device. It's something FDA has already done in guidance documents, recognizing that there are devices that are comp consist solely of software, and I expect that uh, courts will do the same in order to provide fair and equitable results to patients.